All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to uh, Thursday Morning Devotions. Good to be with you as always. And as always, looking forward to sharing what the Lord has for us this morning. <clears throat> and I hope and pray that your week has been going well and that you're looking forward to the weekend, which is only a few days away. Brother Michael, good morning to you. Good to see you this morning. Hope you're doing well. Not far away now, and you guys will be like taken off. Carol, good morning. I'm going to miss you guys. <laughs> I know it's not yet. We'll see you between now and then. Um, so, yes, so I hope everyone's been having a, a relatively good week. I don't know what your week's been like for you, but it's uh, not been too bad for us babysitting now uh, due to Tuesdays and Thursdays. And and so, uh, you know, that's uh, interesting. Ruth, good morning. Good morning. He's a blessing. Uh, let's go to Exodus 15 this morning. Exodus 15, as I said yesterday, you know, all victories are short-lived. <laughs> all victories are short-lived. Uh, you know, Judy, good morning. You know, we we must and we can live from victory to victory. Lindsay, good morning to you. Um, but, you know, the, the, the thing about that is living from victory to victory, and I believe God's called us to be victorious. We are victorious in Christ. The thing about living from victory to victory is that interim part. It's in between finishing one victory and then going to another victory. It's that in between that really makes the difference in our life. And for us as Christians, it really is important how we handle, Sasha, good morning, how we handle the interim because the interim will lead us into the next phase of victory in our life. You know, in between victory to victory, there's there's the struggle with with a lot of different things, faith, doubt, uh, discouragement, and all of that. Okay, and so therefore we can and must. Now here's the children of Israel. The children of Israel, Kurt Donner, good morning. Uh, the children of Israel, they've just finished their rejoicing. Remember that song that Moses and the congregation were singing and. Miriam then picked it up with the timbrels and the dance with all the ladies and, and everyone was just reveling and rejoicing in this amazing victory. The horse and the rider, they're thrown into the sea. You know, we, we've looked at that this week and man, they're all excited and they now begin the journey. Moses, Aaron, Miriam's probably there out the front. Okay, gang, let's go. We're heading off. And, you know, they. the report is that there's well over a million people plus livestock that now begin this journey out, right? Really, it was only meant to be a short journey before they went into the promised land, but that's another uh, lesson for another day. But they've started this journey out exciting. It's just, man, they're pumped, all right? And it's like when we first got saved. I don't know if you still remember when you first got saved. I remember when I first got saved. Man, it was so exciting. Brother Rolf, good morning. Everything was new. Oh, man, I, I couldn't wait to witness to my friends. I couldn't wait. I, I loved reading my Bible. Couldn't wait to go to church. All that sort of stuff. It was just new. It was exciting, man. And, and the Christian journey starts out with a bang and excitement. I don't know what it was like for you. That's what it was like for me. Yours could be different. But it wasn't too far along into their journey where they encountered discouragement. They ended up in a place of desperation. Listen very carefully to verse number 22 of Exodus 15. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days into or in the wilderness and found no water. They found no water. Now, I tell you, water is the elixir of life, is it not? I need to drink more of it. There was a time where I was drinking more water, and but I find water to be very boring. <laughs> Sorry, I'd rather drink my, uh, I love, anyway, I'm going to go there. Um, but we know that water is the sustenance of life. And when you've got over a million people plus livestock, that is a lot of water that you need. And they've come to this, they've come three days into this journey. They've got, they've found no water. They're probably, parents are worrying about the kids. Livestock are dragging their hind feet and all this sort of stuff. And they're parched and they're just, they're thirsty. They're thirsty. Well, they see something into the, into the, in the distance there. They come across a, a body of water. Everything looks hopeful. 
Things are picking up. Their hearts that were dropped and drooping and saddened have now lifted and they've got a little bit of a pep in their step. They see a body of water. Things are looking up. We've got some water, but hope, hopefulness ends up into helplessness or hopelessness because the water was not drinkable. Verse number 23, and when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. Remember Naomi and Ruth, when she uh, goes back to Bethlehem, Judah, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Lord hath dealt bitterly with me. And she was a very bitter elderly lady. Mara means bitterness. And now they've gone from this hopefulness to this helplessness, this hopelessness. It's like we can't drink what's going on. And the murmuring begins. Do you know that the majority of murmuring and complaining centers around bitterness? I can picture these folks, can't you? I mean, you've got this body of water. I don't know how big it was. It it must have been a decent size. But I can see all these people on the on the outskirts, you know, just just on the brink of the water, just surrounding it, looking at this water. Try it; they just can't have it. I don't know if you've ever tried to drink well water or water out of it, and it's just brackish. It's bitter. You just can't drink it, and you know you boil it in the billy or whatever, and it just just doesn't taste the same. And I can see them all standing around the brink of this wall, just complaining. And, and, and murmuring and complaining, is really, the, the centerpiece for murmuring and complaining is bitterness. And this is where they're at. They're murmuring, they're complaining. And there's a great picture here because it's, 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 it's focusing on bitterness. The waters are bitter and they're murmuring and complaining. I want to talk to you this morning on this thought that the cross is the cure. The cross is the cure. We're going to get to that in a moment. But when we think about bitterness, I want to just go here for a moment. I want to go to the book of Job. Let me just read some scripture here in Job for you. Job chapter 7 and verse number 11. Now, Job was an upright man. I mean, he went through some stuff, didn't he? We all know the account of Job and the trials and the struggles, the things that his so-called friends were saying about him. But, you know, Job, Job, um, Job did become bitter. Now, we might look at that and we think, you know, I don't blame him. (laughs) Do you? I mean, if that was you in his shoes, and and God forbid that any of us should end up in Job's shoes, sometimes we feel like we're experiencing what Job experiences, but we really haven't. And, 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 you know, one, one could feel sorry for Job. You know, he's, he's bitter. Listen to what Job says in chapter 7, verse number 11. Therefore, I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. I'm going to complain. See, murmuring and complaining. The children of Israel surrounding that body of water that was bitter and bitter. And murmuring and complaining centers. The, the very centerpiece for murmuring and complaining is bitterness. And Job saying, I'm going to complain out of the bitterness of my soul. I'm not doing too good and I'm going to complain about that. And my complaint is going to be filled with bitterness. He says the same thing in chapter 10 and verse number 1. My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. You know, the mouth, I was reading this the other day, I was, I'm reading through James, some of you know that, and I got to James chapter 3, James chapter 3 dealing predominantly with the mouth, the tongue, and uh, how that's a very hard thing to control. And, uh, you know, it goes on about the mouth, it talks about the fountain, you know the mouth is a fountain, it's where everything gushes out of And James says, out of the fountain can't spring both sweet water and bitter, one or the other. You know know the sweetness of a believer by what they're saying. Now, we all should be sweet, right? But there are times in our life where we go through some things and hope turns to hopelessness and despair and anguish and trials and struggles and all of that and and the sweetness <laughs> dissipates into bitterness and out of the fountain out of the gusher out of the spout the one preacher said this i want to sit under the spout where the glory comes out <laughs> gotta love those american preachers 
But the mouth is that spout. The mouth is the fountain out of which comes sweet or bitter. You can tell the condition of the Christian by what comes out of the fountain. And when bitterness is flowing from the mouth of the believer, you know that bitterness is in the soul. They really haven't handled what they have experienced. They've allowed the murky waters of bitterness to invade their soul. And now they're speaking out of the bitterness of their soul. Job's complaining, my complaint, my anguish. And we might, you know, could forgive him for being that way because we would all be that way. But listen to what he says here in Job 21, verse 25. And another, and another dieth in the bitterness of his soul and never eateth with pleasure. When you look at this term eating, 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 I, I love to think about what's being said here. One dies in the bitterness of his soul and never eateth with pleasure. You know, he's not happy about anything. And eating is an experience. You know, a bitter person never experiences the pleasures of life. You know, it doesn't really matter how bad the government get and all that. No, I know. But, you know, in Christ, there are some pleasures that we have in Christ. And woe be the Christian that dieth in the bitterness of his soul. He never eats out of pleasure. He's always murmuring, always complaining. Nothing's ever good enough. And, you know, you can have a beautiful steak in front of you with all the trimmings and, you know, my homemade gravy on it, which is the best. <laughs> I could make some money off of that. And, uh, you know, it would, but it would still never be good enough. They never experience pleasure because of the bitterness that's in their soul. Now, I said earlier on that the cross is the cure. I want you to go back to Exodus 15 if you're, if you're not there. If you're there, just listen to this. They've come to this water now, this Mara, it's bitter. The people murmured against Moses 24, what shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet, there he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. He came across this tree, and God said, here's a tree. I want you to throw this tree into the waters, and the water that was bitter was made sweet. I want you to listen to this verse in Acts chapter 5 for a moment, because you could be thinking, well, what's the deal with the cross? Well, listen to this in Acts chapter 5, verse number 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree hanged on a tree him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior hanged him on a tree in Exodus 15 they threw a tree into the bitter waters of Mara and it became sweet the tree in Exodus 15 is a picture of the cross did you know that the Lord Jesus Christ has already made provision through his death on the cross to cure you or those that you know that may be struggling with bitterness? There's a lot out there. There's a lot of people out there that are living in bitterness. And you know, how do you know that? Well, out of the fountain. I'm going to complain out of the bitterness of my soul. Oh, I was wronged. I was this, this person, and off they go. You know what I mean? And, you know, I was, I'm not going to go to Hebrews because we know what Hebrews talks about bitterness. It, it springs up, it defiles you and troubles many. And when you sit under the fountain of bitterness and that person is just spewing forth bitterness, it does trouble you. It vexes you. As good Christians, we sit and we listen. But really, we ought to offer some sort of hope to these people. Say, you know what? You don't have to live in the anguish and the bitterness of your soul. The cross is the cure. They threw a tree into the bitter waters and it became sweet. They hung Jesus on a tree. The cross, brethren, is the cure. I love Isaiah 53, and I want to read Isaiah 53. I'm going to scoot through some passages, and you might want to just listen very quickly. He says in Isaiah 53, verse 5, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. 
Now, before you might think, well, that's talking spiritually, spiritually when I got saved, I was healed spiritually. And to that, I would say, hallelujah, amen, I agree with you. But the power of the cross just didn't affect the spirit of man. As a matter of fact, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 8. I love this because there are so many people around in our Baptist circles that, oh, is uh, healing's not part of the redemption? Is there healing in redemption and all this? So, listen to me. Every good thing that comes to man comes through the cross. Comes through the redemptive power of the cross. The cross is the cure for bitterness. The power of the cross makes the bitter sweet. Aren't you glad that Jesus has made a way? Listen to this carefully because it's actually quoting from Isaiah 53 here in Matthew chapter 8. And it says in verse 16, When the even was come, they brought, out, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. That's a wonderful thing. Look what Jesus did to these spiritly spirit possessed people his evil spirit that were possessing people and they were sick and they were struggling verse 17 that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses bitterness could be an infirmity bitterness can be a sickness and we know that through what Jesus Christ did on the cross we know that he can heal the bitterness. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, By his stripes we are healed. Again, Peter quoting from Isaiah 53. I want to submit to you this morning, dear brethren, that, that, the, that the cross is the cure. He's already provided a cure. The problem is, is that people don't access the cure. It's unfortunate, but we've been told for years that, you know, there is no healing in redemption. Well, I disagree with that, but just I only need one scripture. But, you know, it's a blessing to know that. And I want to go finish here with this verse in, in Psalm 147, because in Psalm 147, listen to what he says here in verse number three. It says, he healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Pastor Michael Mills, good morning. He healeth the broken heart. You know, uh, a broken heart can produce bitterness. People go through cycles. Uh, just recently, uh, you know, I could say from a family perspective, some things have happened and things that we never planned and, and affecting our family and, and affected our daughter. And she's gone from sadness to anger because of what took place and you go through a cycle and if you're not careful as Christians you allow the emotion and we're all created with emotion emotion's not bad but emotions have got to be controlled by the spirit it's a tough thing it's very hard I understand that but if you allow the broken heart to ferment a broken heart's going to bring forth bitterness. But notice what the psalmist said. He healeth the broken heart. Who? The Lord Jesus. You know, the Bible says, I, I was going to use that as my last verse. I can't. You know what I'm like. I, I, I start sharing and then verses. I, I, and I'm going to just, I'm going to blame the Holy Spirit. He's just give me another verse. <laughs> Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken hearted. No doubt Job was broken hearted. Out of the bitterness of his soul, he, he says, I'm going to speak. So the children of Israel, they come to the place in their life where they've gone three days into the journey. They've gone from rejoicing and excitement, you know, just to this anticipation, this joy, hopefulness, hopefulness to hopelessness. There's murmuring, complaining, and it's centered around bitterness. But the tree that was thrown into the water was the cure. It made the bitter water sweet. And the tree, according to Acts 5.30, what a picture of the cross it is. And the cross is the cure. Jesus has already made a way for those that are bitter in heart to be healed. And I hope and pray 
that if you struggle with bitterness, that you'll access, if you please, the cross through which Jesus died on so that he can heal your broken heart, the bitterness that perhaps is confronting you. Take advantage of that. The cross is the cure. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and blessing to us. Lord, thank you for what was accomplished on the cross. And yes, we rejoice that it affected our spirit and spiritually we are healed and we thank you for that. But really, the cross, your word, everything affects spirit, soul and body. And we thank you for that. Lead us and guide us. I pray for that one that may be struggling with bitterness. Lord, that they will just access by faith the power of the cross and receive that healing in Jesus name. Amen. All right. God bless you. Thanks for joining this morning. I appreciate that. Have a great day in the Lord, brother John. Good morning. We'll see you tomorrow morning. God bless you until then. Bye for now.